Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello everybody, this is Dr. Vishal Trivedi from Department of Biosciences and Bioengineering IIT Guwahati. And so far what we have discussed, we have discussed about the structure of prokaryotic cell as well as the structure of eukaryotic cell. And also what we have discussed, we have discussed about the different organelles what are present in the eukaryotic cell and uh, we have also uh, discussed their functions in the, uh, in the cell. And today what we are going to discuss, we are discuss, we are going to discuss about how you can isolate these different organelles so that you can use them for downstream applications. Uh, uh, in the case of prokaryotic cell as well as in the eukaryotic cell, you have different regions which could be important for uh, recovery of the product. And uh, in this context, uh, let us discuss what are the regions are present in a prokaryotic cell for uh, isolating the proteins. So, as you can see the in, a, in, a, in a typical prokaryotic cell what you have, you have the, uh, you have the capsule and then in below the capsule you have the cell wall and then below the cell wall you have the plasma membrane and, in, in, and inside you have the cytosol or the cytoplasm. So, in the case of prokaryotic cell you have the two major places where you can actually use or use to extract the proteins. What are these places? You have the cytoplasm, uh, you have the cytoplasm and the other place what you can use also is the periplasmic space. So, what is the periplasmic space? The periplasmic space is the space which is present in, in between. So, within the cell wall, you have the outer membrane and then you have the inner membrane. So, within the cytoplasm, you have a in between there is a space and this space is called as the perisplasmic space and this space can be used for storage of different types of proteins. Now, you can see the relative uh, distribution of the proteins in the different subcellular structures. So, what you have is in the periplasmic space, you have the 129 proteins and uh, whereas, the, the protein which are present in the outer membrane or the inner membrane, uh, you have the 50 in the case of outer membrane and uh, you have 21 in the case of the inner membrane and then the major fraction of the protein which is present in the cytoplasm that is the 183 different proteins. So, this means you have the choice of uh, uh, over expressing your protein or uh, you have the choice to isolate the protein from the two region. One is the cytoplasm, the other one is the periplasmic space. So, let us see the, what are the steps you required to isolate the periplasmic fractions. So, as I said the periplasmic fraction is present within, in, within, the, uh, within the cell wall and in the cell wall you have the two layer, one is called outer membrane, the other one is called the inner membrane. So, within this cell wall there is a region which is called as the periplasmic space. So, uh, if you give uh, some kind of osmotic shock, if you give the osmotic shock to the bacteria, what will happen is the protein which are present in this region uh, uh, will, will come off and can be used for the downstream applications. So, these can be done simply by following a sing, uh, similar uh, protocol or simple protocol. In this protocol, what you have to do is first you harvest the bacterial cell uh, from the uh, by centrifugation at 3000 G for 20 minutes at 4 degree. Then once you got the uh, and then you carefully remove the media as well as the supernatant and uh, with the help of the pipette. And once you have removed the supernatant, you will can gently resuspend the pellet in 1 ml of 
tris sucrose uh, EDTA buffer which is called as the TSC buffer using a loop or using a pipette and once the cells are suspended you, uh, you incubate them for 30 minutes in ice. So, this TSC buffer contains uh, sucrose and the sucrose is going to uh, and this also contains uh, tris and EDTA that sucrose actually gives the osmotic shock uh, to the cell uh, and as a result what will happen is the material which are present in the periplasmic fractions comes out into the supernatant. Once they comes out into the supernatant in this uh, 30 minutes, uh, then what you do is uh, the uh, uh, transfer the cell in a micro centrifuge and then centrifuge at a very high speed at 16000 G. Once you spin at 16000 G, the, uh, the, the, it will give you the supernatant as well as the pellet. So, it, it will give you the pellet which is actually the bacterial pellet uh, which contains uh, the, uh, the bacterial cell and the cytosol and other things and then you are going to get the supernatant and this supernatant is going to contain the uh, proteins which are present in the uh, periplasmic fraction. Now, for the isolation of the proteins from the cytosolic fractions, what you can do is you can take the cells and then you sonicate and uh, by doing the sonications you could be able to achieve the breaking of the cells. Once you break the cells what will happen is the cytosolic content will be come out into the supernatant and then what you do is you do a uh, centrifugation uh, as it was done for the, uh, for the periplasmic fraction as well. So, then we, once you do the centrifugation at 16000 G for 30 minutes at 4 degree. Uh, that actually will give you a pellet as well as the supernatant just like it was uh, been discussed for the periplasmic fractions and then uh, uh, the supernatant will contain the uh, proteins from the, uh, from the cytosol and the pellet will contain the dead or the damaged bacterial cell which you can discard. So, this is for the uh, prokaryotic cells. Now, talking about the eukaryotic cell, as we discussed uh, previously also, the eukaryotic cells are much more uh, complicated compared to the eukaryotic cell and they contains well defined the uh, well defined uh, membranous organelles and most of these organelles are useful for uh, both for the, uh, for the study in terms of uh, if you want to study the function of a particular protein as well as some of the organelles are also being used for protein productions. So, whether it is a animal cell or a plant cell in both the cases you can use the some of the dedicated organelles for making for producing the proteins. Uh, Let us see what are the these organelles. So, in a typical uh, eukaryotic cell what you have is the, uh, the, re the places where you can actually uh, get the proteins in larger fractions or the organelles which are uh, of uh, having the high importance in terms of the research as well as for product recovery those are called as. So, there are 4 or 5 place uh, organelles which are having the very high importance uh, as far as the eukaryotic cell is concerned. Uh, what are these uh, organelles? One is called mitochondria plasma membrane, chloroplast and cytosol. So, chloroplast is actually the protein production machinery as, uh, as in the case of plant uh, whereas, the uh, in the case of animal cell the cytosol is the uh, site for the protein production. But if you know the isolation of these organelles, you could be able to isolate either these organelles or you could be able to remove these contaminating organelles from the cytosol and that actually will give you a very high uh, purity in terms of extracting the compound, uh, extracting your uh, uh, specific proteins uh, and that actually also uh, helps in terms of the downstream processing and make the purification of these proteins uh, simpler. Before getting into the details of how to fractionate the eukaryotic cell and uh, 
how to use them let's see what are the uh, technical tools are available to you to achieve the uh, uh, organellar separations from the uh, eukaryotic cells so most of these uh, fractionation of eukaryotic cell is done by the uh, by the centrifugations or by separating these organelles based on the uh, some of the basic uh, uh, physical properties and uh, there are two physical properties which people are using one is called density the other one is called as the uh, ability of these organelles or the molecular weight or the mass of these organelles this mass of the organelle is indirectly related to the ability of these organelles for their sedimentation in a given uh, 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 given uh, buffer or the given micro environment so the instrument what you can use for um, the extraction of or the isolation of these organelle is known as the centrifuge so you have different varieties of centrifuge which are available for uh, r and d as well as for industrial purposes you have the micro centrifuge which where you can use the smaller samples like the appendoffs then you have the centrifuge with the larger capacities these centrifuges can be used for two purposes one for pelleting down the bacteria which are being grown in the large cultures like 1 liter 2 liters and then also these can be used for culturing uh, for uh, for uh, removing the uh, the cells uh, removing the uh, uh, dead and damaged cells from the cell lysate which means these are these centrifuges can be used for clarification of your sample as well these centrifuges are available which are uh, either the temperature and uh, temperature stable means you can use them at 4 degree or you can use at room temperature that is uh, 37 or the 25 degree celsius and uh, apart from that you also have the ultra centrifuge these ultra centrifuge can be used to spin the centif uh, spin the sample at a very very high speed such as the 1 lakh g or more than 1 lakh g the advantage of these centrifuges are that this allow you to separate the uh, the organelles which are very very light or which are having the coefficient this is the typical rotor what people are using for the ultra centrifuge and uh, this is a another uh, uh, centrifuge where you can uh, you can spin the animal cells and this has been used in most of the uh, uh, cell culture applications where you uh, pelleted the cells and you do the subculturing of these cells using the this kind of uh, cell culture uh, using these cell culture specific centrifuges uh, apart from the, cent the centrifuge machines, you have the uh, uh, freedom of doing two different types of centrifugations. Uh, you have the differential centrifugations or the density gradient centrifugations. In the differential centrifugations, what you do is you run the sample at different speeds or different RCF values, and because of that, when you spin down the molecule which is corresponding to that rcf value get pelleted down and get uh, you will find that particular organelle or the uh, substance in the uh, in the pellet fraction whereas the supernatant will contain all other molecules once you take the supernatant you can spin again spin at a very slightly more high, high speed and that's how you can be able to separate the molecule based on their sedimentation coefficient or the sedimentation rates whereas in the case of density gradient centrifugations what you do is you exploit the ability of or you exploit the density of a particular uh, uh, solvent system or the uh, 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 in my, uh, buffer actually so what you do is you vary the uh, the uh, density of the uh, external buffer and because of that what will happen is the biomolecules are getting biomolecule or the organelles are getting separated because they holds the, the, the varying density and whenever they matches to their uh, corresponding density they form a band or the zone and that is how you can have the you can develop 
the different zone within the density gradient certifications and every zone you can actually isolate later on and can be used or can be represented by a particular org length. So, let us discuss these two techniques, how these te two, two techniques can be used to uh, separate the uh, different organelles. So, as I said in the differential certification, differential certification is based on the differences in the certification rate of the biological properties of a different sizes, shape and the density. You can imagine a situation where you have the particles of different sizes, shape as well as the uh, uh, density and when you do the differential centrifugation, in one round of centrifugation, these particles are going to settle down in the pellet fraction, whereas the all the remaining uh, sample will, uh, will, will be present in the supernatant and the subsequent fractions. Uh, when you do this supernatant, you will get this fraction in the pellet and, and, and the third time you will get this fraction in the pellet and that is why it is called as the differential centrifugation because in one, one round of centrifugation, you have isolated this molecule, the second round you have isolated these molecules and the third round you have separated these three molecules and that is how you can actually separate uh, if the samples are suspended in a particular solvent system, the small size medium size and large size particles. Let us take an example, uh, suppose you have the, uh, the different substances and the different material of different sizes, different density. For example, you have a iron block of 100 kg, you have a stone of 30 kg, you have the another iron block of 10 kg, you have a stone of 10 kg, then you have a cotton of 8 kg and you have another iron block which is of 1 kg. So, you know that this uh, uh, cotton is going to have the lower density or it is going to be the lowest density compared to all other samples. Next to that is the stone which is going to be slightly higher density to the cotton. Uh, then you have the iron which is actually going to be the highest density. So, if you do the differential centrifugation, and what you will see is that the 100 kg block is going to be settled down first followed by the 10 kg iron block and the followed by the 1 kg block ok. On to that if you if you further doing that then you will see is that 30 kg stone block will be pelleted down next to that you are going to have the pelleting of 10 kg. At the end what you are going to see is that the 8 kg cotton pellet is going to be settled down which means it actually not only depends on the uh, molecular weight or the density, it depends on the both. It depends on the size, it depends on the density and it depends on the actual molecular actual uh, weight of that particular object. So, you can actually exploit these properties. Now, you can see another example where we have the different types of biological molecules. You have the microsomes, you have the mitochondria, you have nuclei, you have viruses, you have soluble proteins, you have DNA, you have ribosomes, you have polysomes, glycogen which is another biopolymer and what you can see is that the all these molecules have the different sedimentation coefficient, different density. So, if you spin down them, what you will see is all these biomolecules will separate to each other because they will settle down at different steps. So, first round this molecule is going to be settled down, in the second round the DNA will be settled down and ultimately in the third round because the soluble protein is going to be settled down. Let us take a real example. So, in the real example, suppose we are isolating the different organelles from the uh, from the liver and what you can see is you take a liver from a uh, animal, let us first step you do the homogenization that will give you the different cells and once you do the homogenization that will that will break down the or, uh, organ and it will give you the individual cells. If you do the further homogenization, the individual cells will be broken down and then they will give you a combination of organelles which will be present in your vessel 
and these uh, uh, these uh, different organelles are can be separated because what you do is first you will spin down at a very very low speed that is the 600 g for 10 minutes and that actually is going to give you only for the nucleus or the heavy particles so that will settle down the nucleus in the pellet fraction and all other molecules will be in the supernatant once you take that supernatant and put it into another round of centrifugation and then you centrifuge at 15000 g for 15 minutes at 4 degree then it will pellet down the another uh, heavy particles they are see, these are called mitochondria lysosomes and peroxisomes whereas the remaining organelles will be present in the supernatant once you take these um, uh, sup molecules which are present in the supernatant and do another round of centrifugation at 1 lakh g which you will do in ultra centrifuge for one hour what you will see is now it has pelleted down the plasma membrane er fragments and the smaller vesicles such as the uh, which are called the light membranes and now if you take the supernatant and do another round of uh, centrifugation and now you do a centrifugation at 3 lakh g for 2 hours which also you are going to do in the ultra centrifuge what you are going to get you are going to get the very very small particles like ribosomes you are going to get the viruses and you are going to get the free proteins and if you take this supernatant you are going to get the cytosol this cytosol will contains the proteins as well as the uh, salt and all other uh, the liquid material which is present in the typical cell. Now take another example suppose you started with the muscle tissue exactly the same way you are going to do homogenization then if you do a centrifugation for 1000 g for 10 minutes uh, in first rot you are going to get the nuclei as well as the cellular debris once you take the supernatant and do another round of centrifugation at 10000 g for 10 minutes that actually will give you the mitochondrial fraction and the supernatant if you spin down at 1 lakh g that will give you the microsomes as well as the cytosol and if you take these crude microsomes and run it for the density gradient you could be able to even isolate or uh, further divide or purify many material from these microsomal fragments. So what is what we are doing actually is that we are doing a repeated centrifugation at progressively high speed will fractionate a very very complex homogenate of cell into their individual component which means the individual organelles and in general the, the smaller the organelles the, the greater is the centrifugation forces required to sediment it which means if you are working with the lighter and lighter particles just, is, just like as we have taken an example of the, uh, the iron and stone and cotton you might have seen that we are supposed the cotton got pelleted at the end because cotton is having the very very low density compared to the, uh, the stone as well as the, uh, uh, the iron. So uh, the lighter the organelles the larger will be your uh, centrifugation speed. Because of these limitations uh, you can also exploit the densities of these particular organelles or different molecules which are present inside the cell. So in a typical uh, different types of cell which are present in the biological uh, system you have the uh, microbial cell or the prokaryotic cells, you have the mammalian cells you have the organelles which are present in the mammalian cells then you have the proteins dna and rna and as you can see all these molecules have the very very different densities for example in the prokaryotes it is a density between 1 to 1.15 whereas the mammalian cells are slightly different from in density from the uh, from the prokaryotic cells uh, similarly the organelles are very much different from the whole cell and they are uh, in the range of 1.1 to 1.6 uh, whereas the proteins 
DNA and RNA are also having the different densities, which means since these uh, biological samples are having the different densities, you can also use this particular property as well to exploit and purify uh, to separate them in a density gradient centrifugation. So, in a density gradient centrifugation, what you are supposed to do is you make a density gradient media. What is mean by density gradient media? For example, in this case, we have taken a sucrose as a, as a material. So, what you do is you put the sucrose, different uh, concentration of sucrose starting from uh, 0 percent to 30 percent and as a result what will happen is that all these, this media is going to be separated in different zone of different densities according to the concentration of sucrose present in each layer. And then what you do is you overlay your complex solution which is going to be separated. Now you can see that I have used the three different types of beads. One is, bl one is uh, blue, another one is green, another one is cyan and what these beads and then you do a centrifugation. Once you do the centrifugations, these beads will move towards the liquid and because this liquid is containing the media with the different densities it will actually going to create a friction or it will oppose the entry of these molecules. And the place where these molecule will stop is the place where the opposing forces as well as the uh, centrifugation forces are going to be equalized and that place is actually the place which where the density of the media is going to match with your sample. For example, in this case the blue got matched here, the green got matched here and the blue got, uh, yellow got matched here. So, this means the, uh, if you have the, uh, if you have the samples with the variable densities, you can be able to separate simply by centrifugation of these uh, samples in the density gradient. And as you run it, you could be able to make the better separation between the molecules. Uh, and once the separation is over, you could be able to uh, isolate the individual components from this particular tube uh, uh, and you can, you can take out the individual bands from these tubes and you can be able to purify these individual bands into the individual fractions and that actually individual fraction is going to give you the pure organelles or the pure material from the cell. How to collect these material? You have the two uh, options. So, you can imagine uh, we have started like this and we, we run it for 150,000 for uh, 3 hours and that has given you the, the different uh, bands corresponding to the different types of fractions. For example, in this case, this fraction belongs to the sarcoplasmic reticulum fractions, then this fraction belongs to the uh, light sarcoplasmic fractions, this fraction belongs to the triates and this fraction belongs to the uh, plasma membrane or the surface membrane. Now, what you and at the and at the bottom, what you have is the cellular debris. So, what you have, you can actually use the different way of collecting these fractions. One of the way you can do is you can manually put the pipettes. So, these are the typical pipettes which you can use. As you can see, these are the different pipettes and what you can do is you can put a pipette tip in the media and you can easily suck your band of interest. The other way is that you freeze these samples and then you cut these play and these tube in different slices and then individual slice you can take out and then isolate the material which is present in that particular individual band. So, this is what we have discussed so far. What we have discussed? We have discussed about the, uh, the presence of different organelles in the, in, the, in the case of eukaryotic cell and we have also discussed about the different regions which are present in the, uh, in the, uh, in the prokaryotic samples. We have, uh, we have also discussed what are the instruments which are available for you to isolate these, these organelles from the eukaryotic as well as the prokaryotic cells. And then very briefly we have also discussed 
the uh, uh, how to isolate the periplasmic fraction or the cytosolic fraction from the eukaryo uh, from the prokaryotes and in detail we have discussed the different approaches what you can use to isolate the organelles from the eukaryotic cells either you use the differential certifications or the uh, density gradient certifications thank you